morning and greetings to each one of you in Jesus' name on this Lord's Day morning. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, pondered this subject for some time, uh, in relation to, uh, some of the past events, and, uh, it is not a, uh, a new subject. In fact, I was assigned uh, this subject and I didn't go back to uh, my notes from a winter Bible school topping in 06. And then uh, I also have preached on this subject uh, other times as well. So it's not, you may have heard me say some of the things you heard me say. Some of the things I, Lord willing, may say this morning, you probably heard me say before. And I think I say that a fair bit, and I guess it's just the consciousness that I am getting older. And uh, there is probably something within uh, what the within the, a preacher that feels like you should have something new and different to say every time. And the older you get, the more you realize you don't have something necessarily new and different every time to say. Some of the events that made me think of this subject was also, uh, principally around the observance of how conservative Anabaptist people responded to some events. Some of those events were the uh, government insurrection, or uh, the, the insurrection, Washington, D.C., so-called. And I know there's a lot of feelings around this, oh, what happened there in... Uh, January of 2021 or whatever. Uh, also, uh, observing the world conflict between Russia and Ukraine and some of those things. And uh, so I invite you to consider some, some of that all in relation to who we are. Um, I'm going to look at some verses early on here that aren't uh, a text. There are some Passages a little later that I, if you have a Bible, I really encourage you to turn to or to look to. Um, early on, I'm just going to brush up on some things here. These are a, these two verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Peter 3. I'm going to look at two verses that are kind of summarizing Christian duties here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, it says this, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow... But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And I think it, one of the interesting things to note there, it is to happen at this level. It's to happen in our homes, but it's also to happen in, to all men. And it goes on and say it's to happen to everybody, everywhere as we relate. Now I want to quickly go to First Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Again, this is just a, it's, it's kind of, both these passages I see kind of a sum, uh, summary of Christian duties. 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are called thereunto, thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Notice the inherited blessing there in following uh, and f fulfilling the Christian's duty. I, uh, I didn't go back and, and look for sure. I, I don't think I have it recorded. But uh, one of the times I know I preached on this, I, I remember, and I'm pretty sure I know the individual that requested a message on this subject. And uh, as I pondered that this week, I'm pretty sure that person is now a member at Lincoln. They had requested it on a council paper. So, ooh, that's, that's a while ago then. <laughs> uh, kind of uh, uh, made me think about that. So I addressed this subject sometime after that. <clears throat> it's a subject avoided or distorted in much of modern Christianity, uh, as in, in my evaluation, my idea of it. And as we look at it today, I just want you to honestly consider what is God's word, uh, God's directive to his people and you answer that question i'm not going to necessarily tell you i'm going to yeah i'm going you're going to see my idea 
uh, from God's word, what I think it's saying. So what's the subject matter? Any guesses? The call to non-resistance. First point is, and I'm going to spend a while on this one, because I think it's the basis for non-resistance. Uh, we need to look at, at an underlying basis, um, much deeper than the initial, maybe, uh, first blush look at something. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Does anybody know what that, what that is off the top of their head? You don't have to turn to this. You're all going to recognize it right away as soon as I start reading it. Probably quite a bit of you could say it by memory once I start reading it, if you don't know before. Anybody who doesn't know what it is? It's Isaiah's prophecy of what Jesus is going to look like. This is what it says. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That last and climaxing title uh, given to Christ here is the Prince of Peace. The work of Christ is to bring peace between God and man. That's what it would be. He was going to be the prince. He was going to be about peace, and he was going to make peace. Um, I think we often forget that there is a great war, the biggest war, the ongoing war, that will, as long as the earth stands, be a war, and that is between evil and good, between God and Satan. And Christ stepped into the middle of that war to make peace on our account if we are willing to uh, allow that to be. All true and lasting peace, true and lasting peace, has its origin in Christ. Therefore, it only makes sense that Christ's children will be agents of peace. Non-resistance is an outward manifestation of this peace being a reality in our soul. Non-resistance is an, an outward outflow springing out of a well that has peace within it. Another major attribute of God is found in Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, and I'm going to read verses 38 through 48. As soon as I'm done, I'm done reading, I'm going to ask you what that attribute is. You've heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh of thee, and for him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, and what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What's the great attribute of God that's called out there? Four letter word. Love. love. It is love. The supremacy of love in the New Testament era is clear here. In verse 38, it shows the Old Testament standard, and here Jesus introduces a new way. Uh, the principle is to lay aside self-interest and serve others, even those that may not know or those that oppose us. We may not know them, or they may actually be, quote-unquote, the enemy, those, are, those that oppose us. I think one of the interesting things, again, I gain from study is that... Um, so would it be fair to say that the Old Testament allowed revenge? 
it was an interesting thing to study, that this was not really, um, the eye for the eye, the tooth for tooth, was not necessarily for the individual. You smash me here, I can smash you a little bit harder here. That's not what, that's not the context. Is It's really uh, the context of the Old Testament era, the Jewish people being God's chosen people, and they still are his chosen people, but he was giving them governmental structure. It was really a guideline for the government and the judge versus at the individual level, but be that as it may, one way or the other. I think it is interesting to note that ne revenge was never um, part of God's plan for people to, to exact revenge on each other. <clears throat> We may come back to Matthew 5 later, but this kind of opens a door that I want to go through into one of the other things that can come up with this sub subject, uh, particularly with other Christian so-called groups. Um, and related to how God maintained that some groups will maintain that God uh, had his people, uh, individuals and groups, use force. And uh, there are instances of this, and, and that's, there's no debate in the Old Testament. One of the things to ponder is, though, the commands from God of thou shalt not kill and love your enemies were Old Testament. They were Old Testament. And they are still apply today. They, they would maybe be sometimes what we would say are creation principles or for mankind for all time. But some of these other groups then, they justify the just war theory, if you've heard of that, in particular by looking at Moses, Joshua, David, etc. And say, why was it right for them and not for us? That's one of the debates. Why could, why could they do it? Why could the Israelites do it and not us today? I think it's important for us to consider that. I want to go to Hebrews 8 to look at this. I think it's important for us to understand this. Um, it really helps us uh, understand why we are at where we are at today. Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 8. I don't have... The, Hebrews is a fairly deep uh, book, and, and as you get in some things here, it can kind of be a struggle to pull a couple verses out. And, uh, and, but it's looking, chapter 8 here is looking at the priesthood of Christ, who Christ was, the great high priest, and then I'm kind of jumping in there. Chapter 8, verse, starting in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much... Also, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We are blessed to live in the second of the two covenants. The New Testament, sometimes uh, the new era. It is better, according to verse 6. And friends, when the two covenants seem to disagree, we always defer to the new. It is God's last to us. Almost without fail, you cannot justify revenge, protecting self, whatever all, from the New Testament. You will always need to go to the old for that, for a scriptural basis. I don't think, I don't understand there be, to be any way that we can justify resistance of much any way, particularly thinking maybe of war here from the New Testament. I would say, the, I think we want to be, I want to be clear, I want to be careful. The old is not wrong or bad. We're not saying that. It's just that the new is completing and better. It, it, it fulfills. It moves. It raises the bar, so to speak. You hear that term. Moving on, a very closely related topic. 
And uh, I, I thought of this in relation to what Sheldon had talked. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to Colossians 3, if you want to be turning there a while. Colossians 3, because this, this is getting at the heart of uh, non the basis for non-resistance. Um, thought about this when Sheldon was sharing his message on voting. And I thought about the context of the closeness of non-resistance to that and um, kind of why I questioned whether and tried to discern if it was God's will for a message on this related to that because the two are very, very closely related. And I think this particular aspect really ties them closely together. And that's called the, the, the two kingdom concept. And I, I know I've brought that idea up numerous times in my preaching. But when I became aware of that, it just made so much sense. It brings so many things into clarity. When you get a real feel for we must see everything in light of the two kingdom concept. And I can't go to a real nice 8, 10, 15 verse passage that lays it all out for you. But it is woven all through the New Testament. But uh, in these verses, in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, it, it gives us a little bit of a picture of that. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. There's God's kingdom, or Christ's kingdom, and there's this world's kingdom. And there are the only two kingdoms. Notice from verse 2 there, there is only two kingdoms that can hold a person. There's one, one of those two can hold a person's interest. We are greatly affected by the kingdom we are a part of. And, and all that springs from our life is an evidence of which kingdom we really have a heart for. Which one? The one that our citizenship really lies in. Friends, non-resistance does not make sense to a person that is in this world's kingdom. It never will. Non-resistance, it will not make sense. It is, it is opposed to it. And anyone that is in, in, in this world's kingdom cannot, cannot be, a, it just doesn't make sense. It, is, it will not, and it will not work. I want to go to probably the most significant verse in relation to non-resistance in John 18, 36. There are, um, there's another passage a little later that I want to point out that I think are really at the core of non-resistance. But John 18, 36, if you forget everything else I say this morning, try to remember this verse, ponder this verse Ponder what Jesus was saying when he said this, um, because it is foundational for non-resistance. John 18, I'm going to start reading at verse 35. We recognize this is when Jesus was on trial before Pilate. Pilate answered, am I, well, maybe I should read verse 34. And Jesus answered him saying, <laughs> I keep looking, maybe I should go to 33. <laughs> Pilate said in verse 33, he said, are you a king? And then Jesus said in verse 34, Jesus answered him, saying, Hearest thou this thing of thyself or of others tell it thee? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Notice verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should, be delivered on, that I should not be delivered unto the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. Now also, I'm going to revert, refer to verse 37. So let's continue reading. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
Jesus here again clearly says, there is my kingdom and there is another kingdom. And then he goes a step farther and makes it clear that his servants, believers, do not fight. There's a quite an old tract. I think I may have read this years back. Um, the Triumph, Peace, and Power of True Christianity. It was an early Anabaptist. Uh, track because they were kind of pioneering something that hadn't been practiced at all for quite a while. And uh, this is just a short paragraph from this track. The evangelicals, quote unquote, they use evangelicals in quote there, lose the reality of the cross of Christ when they sit behind the protection of lords, princes, and cities to defend themselves. Only under the cross of Christ may patience be learned and all anxiety overcome. Christ the lamb triumphs in the cross, not like the lion, the bear, the wolf, the dog, the leopard, who fight and tear one another with their teeth. Uh, yeah, it's quite obvious, something written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But it does help us see, again, the disparity between the two kingdoms. <clears throat> Back to the thought in John 18, Jesus shows that his kingdom is not built on the same nature as the earthly kingdoms. What are earthly kingdoms built on? Earthly kingdoms of this world maintain armies and engage in wars, along with many, many other things. What are earthly kingdoms built on? They are material. They are physical. I think it's really important to, to understand that. And Jesus says here is, my kingdom is not physical. My kingdom is not material. Because then it would be the same nature. And then, what would, if his kingdom was physical, material, what would happen? According to verse 36, John 18, 36. What would happen? What did Jesus say? I'd have soldiers. Physical soldiers, if I had a physical, material kingdom. I think that's so important to get that. <clears throat> so what is the nature of Jesus' kingdom? Anybody want to, what, what is the, if it's not physical and material, what, what's the nature of his kingdom? Peace. Peace? And peace, because we can have peace in the physical to, to a point, but what is his kingdom? If it's not physical, what's spiritual. spiritual? His kingdom is spiritual, and we want to we want to get a hold of that. Jesus, according to verse thirty-seven, I think Jesus did come to be a king. He did, but not a physical king. He wasn't in competition with Pilate or Herod or anyone else. His kingdom was what? A, to be. He was starting, and it hasn't fully, it hasn't come into all its glory yet, but he's building it, and it's spiritual. I think it's really important for us to, 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 to get that. It's not material. It is not physical. But he did come to rule. Where does he want to rule? If his kingdom is spiritual, where does he want to rule? President of the United States. Is that right? No, that's physical. That's material. Where did he come to rule? Where does he want to rule? In people's hearts. He came to rule hearts. I think that's so foundational for us to, 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 to lay hold of that. It's the basis for non-resistance. Now, it takes a contrite, a willing, obedient human heart for that to happen. So how did he seek victory? Military force, government, legal power, wealth and material influence. Is that how you win people's hearts? No. You never win hearts that way will not work. In fact, when you use those things, it often can tend to harden hearts. 
So how is he going to be king of hearts? The only thing Christ came with and still uses in 2022 and will ever use, according to Matthew 5, is what? That four-letter word, love. That's how Jesus came to win the spiritual conflict, the war between good and evil that Satan put in motion when he rebelled against him back before man stood on the earth. <clears throat> Love is the only thing, the only thing that will bring lasting peace and unity. And 6,000 years of human existence has proved that. Could, has man been ever able to bring lasting peace? No, we can't do it. And our forms of doing it. The basis, brothers and sisters, for non-resistance is the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. That is the basis for it. How Jesus lived while he was here as a man and his teaching to us in the, and principally in the New Testament. Interesting to me, we can say that's pretty foreign, and it is maybe. How many of you were there the name Dean Ta the night Dean Taylor spoke on a Wednesday night at the fire hall? Okay, less than ten hands, I believe, and I figured it was a pretty small group. Interesting story. Man and his wife were serving in the military. And simply by reading the Bible said, you know what? We're missing the boat. We shouldn't be where we're at. And he had no exposure to any teaching of that other than reading the Bible. I don't know if we have time. No, we're not probably going to have time. There's more to his story. <clears throat> I'm not saying everything about, the, I think Dean Taylor is involved at Sattler College. No, I'm not saying everything that Dean Taylor says is gospel. I'm not saying that at all. But I think he does have an interesting life story. Moving on to the second point, the non-resistant heart. We looked at the basis for non-resistance. Now we want to look at the heart, the non-resistant heart. The truth of non-resistance as a way of life can clearly be seen in Scripture. But the hardest part of living it out is for our heart to be sanctified day by day. For the greatest battlegrounds is in the heart of each one of us. That's where non-resistance starts. And it is a daily battle to happen in there. <clears throat> there is still within each human heart, even the redeemed, a desire is part of the sin nature and it's the desire for self first. That is opposite of non-resistance. I'm going to quickly go back to that Colossians 4. Uh, I'm just going to refer to that. You uh, can turn there if it's going to help you. As I, I just mentioned several things. in or Colossians 3. Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4. From verse 1 I see that non-resistance must come from a heart that is renewed and changed by Christ. And so I ask each one of us, we need to ponder on a really regular basis to who or what is my supreme attachment. What is most important, maybe is it to, us, to me personally, to you. Back to thinking about the two kingdoms. What is living for Christ worth for you? What will you trade to be faithful to Christ? Remember, where your affection is, your citizenship is. We know where our citizenship is by where our affection is. We have a choice, but there is no dual citizens. That is clearly not an option. We're in one of two kingdoms. And we don't judge that. I think it's real important to remember that. We don't judge that. We don't have to. <clears throat> The Christian life, according to verse 3 here, is an ongoing death with death to self and, and life with Christ and an alliance with Christ and his kingdom. And I think that's real important to, to understand that. 
then this world won't be our supreme attachment and the overriding influence in our life. And also, according to verse 4, the believer's goals, dreams, and longings are based in Christ and not this life. How many of you find that a challenge? Get them all up. You're not being honest with me. The believer's goals and dreams and longings are based in Christ and not this life. And friends, we, that is part of the daily dying that needs to happen and is not easy. I have not fully accomplished it. And from what I understand from scripture and, and observe in human existence, none of us ever get there. But we need to be working at it. We need to keep pressing towards it. But friends, it is impossible to join the peace, joy, and righteousness of Christ's kingdom and the fighting anger and sin of the world, they don't mesh. They don't go together. And we have to recognize that and, uh, and be willing to look at that. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 say this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Being non-resistance is not for the weak and the scared. That is one of the challenges that the world will throw at us occasionally. You're scared. You're chicken. That's why you're non-resistant. That's not true. That is a lie from the devil. The Christian is in a difficult war throughout life. And that war f is the first step in a spirit that is renewed by God. And then as that spirit is renewed, the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, I would understand it, are controlled by the power of God. And that is the war that we need to be engaged in daily and is not easy. And it gets tiring and is discouraging. But we, friends, we need to continually strive at that. I think there's a lot more involved in this subject than just war and guns and bombs and nuclear weapons and so on and so forth. Friends, our young people have a problem seeing what's wrong with military service when dad fights tooth and nail to make sure no one takes advantage of him financially. Put my foot, no, nobody crosses me up at the checkbook. They have trouble understanding the love of Christ when they see a mother that keeps a running record of anyone that's wronged her. And I don't ever help them. You know what they did to me? No way. They did this and this to us, and we don't help them. We don't. Hmm. That is not a non-resistant heart. And the next generation won't buy into the idea that I shouldn't go to war if we're having those kinds of attitudes in our hearts and in our homes. Non-resistance is really an issue of where our heart is. My third and last point, the non-resistant life. Back to Matthew 5. Um, a person with a heart full of love for self will find these verses impossible to live out. There, it's no, it's no, not, we won't even consider it. And rightly so. It is humanly impossible. Notice the last three verses, verses 46 through 48. Living out non-resistance gives a loud, clear testimony for Christ. For all people know it is not what? It's not natural. It is not how I think. It's not how the neighbor thinks. It's not how the Russians think. It's not how anybody thinks. Except who? The child of Christ. You see, we get a change of nature. 
I read this story, I think, years ago as well. Uh, why I can't fight. Loy Ness uh, was a conscientious objector in the First World War. Any of you that are familiar with Anabaptist history, there was no recognition of conscientious objectors at that point. And uh, during the First World War, many, many Mennonite young fellows were put through the mill at, camp, at military camps because of it. And friends, well, there is no guarantee that we will always get off easy because we're conscientious objectors. Be that as it may, uh, I'll read a very short excerpt from this book. <clears throat> the second basic biblical reason for non-resistance is love. Love your enemies. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, when we love our enemies, is there anyone not included in our love? In one camp where the COs were segregated in their own camp area with a guard over them, one of the boys received a box of fruit in the mail from his mother. When he opened the box, the other boys huddled around him, expecting to receive a treat from him. The guard was sitting some distance away, but close enough to see and to hear what was going on. The boy who received the box saw an apple near the bottom, and digging out, he told the other boys, Look, here is the biggest apple in the lot. We'll give it to the corporal, who is the guard for them. One of the boys took it over to him. The corporal shed tears as he took the apple, saying, I don't understand you fellows the way I treated you and now you give me the largest apple in the box <clears throat> you see the non-resistant life doesn't make sense when we're living according to the natural man I'm going to try to go quite quickly I think I can cover some of these last bases pretty quickly Romans 12 18 through 21 says this if it be possible as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good Possibly this should have been included in the point about the heart. But friends, the Christian cannot live out the natural spirit of revenge. Have that as the overriding influence in our relationship if we're going to win others to faith in Christ. The actions of revenge will never draw others to a savior. It is not drawing. It, it creates divides. We could go to Matthew 6, 26, verse 52. Jesus clearly told Peter there um, to put up his sword away. An interesting question, something I've pondered a bit, and I don't have an answer. What does Jesus say at the end of that dialogue with Peter in the garden there? He says, he that taketh up the sword shall perish with the sword. What was he saying? Was he saying... If you kill somebody, you're going to get killed. He may have been to a point uh, as a general principle. Is it possible instead of physically and materially in this life, he was talking on the spiritual and eternal realm. He was saying, if you take up the sword physically, you're going to die spiritually. I don't know. I, there's no definite answer. I'm not saying that's the way it is. I do think it is something to very seriously consider. Not that there's no place for repentance, but I wonder what he, were, what he really meant in that whole... I think that statement was loaded. I don't claim to understand it all. Romans 13, 1 through 6, then. I just read the verses previous. This here is another... This This... Brothers and sisters, is foundational, again, for the non-resistance position. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. I should say, watch the personal pronouns in this. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. 
and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. The rule for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore he must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. And for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. When Dean Taylor was at a military trial for his, he said, I would t- take a non, um, a dishonorable conduct to get out of my serving in the United States military. And this is where the guy that was judging him took him, said, we're the minister, you're the minister of God. So what's the response? Think about the pronouns. Think about the, what were the pronouns used here? He and they were used when he was speaking about the government. When he speaks of his children, he says, thou, you, or ye, are used it's clear he does not intend for the believer to be involved in the government. That's for, that's for them. And he is a, brothers and sisters, we dare not think, we dare not forget that. When we're talking about the government, they are the minister of God. God put them there for a purpose. And we dare not forget that. That doesn't mean that he's wanting his children to be serving in that place. Friends, a non-resistant life affects many areas of life. It starts with what is dear to the heart and where our heart is. For our minds and our actions are driven by the heart. <clears throat> I'd like to think of a very gen- some general principle yet. Our non-resistance is challenged most in the areas that we feel a need to protect ourselves and those we love. So I suggest some areas to consider. When you live out non-resistance today and tomorrow, Lord willing, where's the challenge is going to be? Where is it hard? Probably a lot of us grapple through family and friends, particularly family. And I don't have all the answers to all these things. Another one that can really be hard is when your reputation and your image is challenged, maybe disgraced, maybe wrongfully trodden under. How do we respond? What's our heart? How about our material things? Our home, our land, our business, our money, our vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe to two of the hardest ones. How about our health and well-being? And probably the most significant, our own life itself. If you have a, I don't know if any of us have really felt that our life has been challenged. But it is the story of where the Anabaptist people have come from. The first generations paid dearly with their blood to hand you an example, and be faithful to God. Now, can I show you the opposite in closing? It was interesting to me, and I think I've used this illustration before. I was reading a national publication. It was a hunting magazine. And I do not remember. It was, I believe, about buying land, leasing land, and how you use it to best uh, get your desire for hunting out of it. And uh, I don't remember what the point of the article was. But this writer called out a particular Anabaptist group by name 
What happened was a very wealthy man sold a farm in the Midwest, in the heart of really good deer hunting area. Deeply embedded in the contract of that was that he had lifetime hunting privileges on that farm. Probably because the conservative Anabaptist was being cheap, he did not know that that was deeply embedded in there. Probably didn't have a real good attorney read it. I'm not, I'm not saying we need real good attorneys to protect ourselves. I, uh, hindsight being, but anyhow, he sold that farm. The rich man sold the farm to the Anabaptist man. So what was the response whenever they saw his vehicle back and he was hunting on that land? He sent his boys out through all the woods and swamps and things calling for lost cows that were not lost. Was that non-resistant? Was that right? Think he won the man to the Lord that way? Not a chance. Not a chance. You see, friends, when our stuff is challenged, that's where we find out where our heart is. I'd also like to go to Dean Taylor's story, but I don't have time. But at the end of his trial there, a military trial to get out of the, the military, it, I think as I recall, and you, somebody correct me after the service if I get it wrong, don't take this as, but I, I'm just using it illustratively. He had just a, they had, him and his wife had just a couple months to go. I believe they were in Europe. The end of the Persian Gulf was being fought and Persian Gulf War. And there was some concern that he could be he, taken into conflict where it becomes a lot more personal yet. And so he wanted to get out at, at all costs. And the man that he said, the man that was overseeing, he said, he said, the, he has good signs that the war is just about over. He said, why don't you just hang tight? Stay here. Because it was going to be much, much greater, Dean and his wife's advantage to them, to ride it out. He, he could have just ended his term of service six, eight months later, whatever it was. And then he wouldn't have had to have the dishonorable discharge. And all the benefits that would have came. See, you don't get the benefit. Dishonorable discharge, you don't get the benefits. Right? If he'd have filled out his term and he said, just lay low. It'll be okay. And Dean said, no, we're not. That's not the point. I want out. Whether it's to my advantage or not, that's not the issue. The issue is I need to leave because I can't do this. It's not always, it, we're not looking for our advantage when we're being non-resistant. We're doing it to honor our Lord and Savior and to turn hearts towards Christ. Shall we kneel for prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a beautiful fall day. We thank you for your love for mankind. I pray that you would be with each one of us as we consider our lives in light of your word, in light of your call to us, in light of your great sacrifice for us. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to walk in your ways. Help us to love your kingdom and do whatever we can to farther your kingdom. I pray for each person here, each brother and sister, each child, that you would help all of us to be the people we ought to be, ever guarding our hearts and aligning them with you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Hymns of the Church, number 999. I'm going to sing Peace, Perfect Peace. It's actually 999A. It fits well with...
the lifestyle we are to live in light of the sermon this morning. Peace, perfect peace. Oh, Thank you for that song. Appreciate each one of your attendance and patience with me. Preacher was a little long-winded today. Shall we all stand for a closing benediction? Let's pray. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever.